Hello, my name is Lorianne Smith. This is One Child Abuse Survivor to Another, the continuation. And we're just looking at the Survivor to Driver workbook. It's a manual put out by the ASC, Adult Survivors of Child Abuse, a more center program. And it's free to use. You can get it on their website. You can download it. You can read it as a web page. And that's www.ascasupport.org. I did pop the info in the chat there. And uh, like they don't mind people using it. And it's for adult survivors of child abuse. Um, I found it very helpful in my healing journey. So that's why I'm sort of going through it here for anybody who's not familiar with it and just wondering if it might be a helpful resource or tool for you in your healing journey. So that's why I'm doing this. And um, I actually have a support group going with them. I, I had before and I had to close it when my husband passed away. But um, I'm glad to get it going again. So I volunteered with them off and on for the last few, over a period of a few years, actually. Quite a few years. So I've, I've attended many meetings. So I found it very helpful. So that's why I'm sharing this information. And, you know, you have to know it's good for you to listen to. If you're sensitive to the topics of abuse, um, you know, child abuse, violence, things like that. You need to, um, you know, just make sure you're safe enough to be listening to this. Or, you know, if it's something that might disturb you or bother you, just turn the channel because you won't be hurting my feelings. <laughs> it's nine o'clock here in the morning for me. It's a little bit early to be talking about child abuse, but this is really the only time I can lock in to actually do this show that I'll actually do it. So I'm used to it because I was brought up in abuse. That was my life. And so, you know, I can look at this stuff and it's not going to bother me. But you have to make that decision for yourself. We're not going to talk about anything too graphic or, you know, anything like that. This uh, Survivor to Thriver Manual is a healing workbook. So, um, but just know for yourself what's good for you to listen to, right? If you're a survivor of abuse, you know, you want to do a safety check and just, you know, that's part of their manual, actually. The first so many pages is a safety first section. And that's just to make sure you're safe enough so you won't be triggered by this type of information. Anything like this can trigger survivors of abuse, especially if you're just starting out on your healing journey. And, you know, you haven't heard a lot about this sort of thing. You might want to just do a safety check and just say, am I safe enough to be listening right now? Do I feel strong enough? Or is this going to bother me and cause me to have a horrible day, uh, you know, to possibly hurt myself or hurt somebody else? And, you know, do that safety check to make sure you're safe enough to be listening. Because if not, you can always, you know, check that manual out another day or whatever. You know, my videos are, you know, you can always come out if you really wanted to see what I had to say about it. But um, just make sure you're safe, right? Because that's the most important thing. And, um, you know, if you're just starting out on your healing journey, like I said, this stuff can be hard and difficult to to listen to, and, and especially if you haven't dealt with a lot of your stuff. So that's why it's really important to do that safety check. And um, But you can grab it, like I said, from the www.ascasupport.org. That's Adult Survivors of Child Abuse and More Center Program. So we left off yesterday looking at um, step eight. That's page 86 of this manual, if you grab it from their website, and, or you can read it as a web page. And um, step eight is, I have made an inventory of the problem areas in my adult life. And this is, you know, for adult survivors of child abuse, right? So these, this would be at the group, if, um, you know, if it was a step meeting, we would be working through these steps, you know, one at a time, progressing through. And this is just step eight. So I've made an inventory of the problem areas in my adult life. And we read through that yesterday in the self-help section. But we didn't get to the professional help, so that's where we'll pick up. And that's making an inventory of problem areas in our life. This professional help section is if you were seeing a therapist or a counselor, you could actually discuss this with your counselor or your therapist. And, um, you know, you could, they may know that you're actually doing this workbook. It's probably a good idea that they did know that you were actually working through this workbook. And you could just use these um, suggestions that they have here to bring that to your therapist and or counselor and um, suggest uh, certain things with them to help you out there. So number one, review your inventory of problem areas with your therapist and discuss how to best address these life issues as you continue to heal your inner wounds. This will give you a sense of control over your recovery and will help you learn to speak up for what you want and negotiate on agreement about the direction of your therapy. While your therapist may have reasons for wanting you to address certain things first, it is your decision that counts the most. And they said, number two, some of the problems you will likely identify, such as physical ailments, sexual problems, severe mood disorders, parenting problems, and work-related concerns are common among survivors and may require the services of specialists. So in general, this is the time for you to develop a more detailed treatment strategy for the various symptoms of the abuse 
that do not readily remit through your weekly therapy sessions. This is in keeping with a holistic approach to recovery, one that seeks to take the best of each therapeutic modality and apply it strategically as part of a comprehensive treatment plan. And number three, for example, if you have body memories that manifest themselves as muscular aches and pains, soreness in certain areas of your body, um, decreased joint flexibility, consider seeing an acupuncturist who may be able to provide either topical or systematic relief for these symptoms. Acupuncture treatments can also trigger the release of specific feelings, especially fear and anxiety, that may then become localized in the specific areas of the body they were direct, directly affected by the abuse. However, unless your acupuncturist is also a trained psychotherapist, you will need to continue to work with your therapist to identify and resolve the underlying feelings. And they said here, the sexual problems can be addressed directly and using specific behavioral techniques. However, these may be outside your therapist's area of expertise, and you may need to seek a referral to a specialist. Severe mood disorders, especially in survivors whose parents were similarly, similarly afflicted, may have a, a physiological base and may not be a delayed reaction to the abuse. If this is the case, therapy may be more effective if augmented by some of the newer psychotropic medications, and you will need a referral to a psychiatrist for a medication evaluation and ongoing monitoring. Likewise, parenting problems may require either a consultation with your pediatrician or a referral to a child or family therapist. So those are the professional um, help um, suggestions from them. And it's just anything that you can do to help yourself, you know, because we're all different and we've all been through different things, we all have different things going on in our life, um, different situations, right? So they try to, you know, sort of cover the basis for, you know, to give some suggestions for most people, you know, who may be going through any number of things, right? Some of that stuff may not apply to you. A lot of it doesn't apply to me. I don't have children, you know, so... Um, it's, you know, this, you have to sort of just take what works for you, leave the rest behind. It's, if it doesn't pertain to you, you don't have to worry about it. Right? And, you know, that's the same with the CSA child sexual abuse. Not everybody was sexually abused, so you don't even have to deal with that stuff. Um, you just pertain, you just uh, use the manual as it pertains to you. Right? Hi, Melissa. How are you? I hope your morning is, your day is going good. Oh, no. That's not good. That's, that's, oh, I, I'm so sorry. I hope that, that you can, you know, recover from that and get well. That's just so hard. Um, I'm so sorry to hear that. And I'm glad you're in the hospital, you know, because that's a scary, scary thing. And it's, you know, having to have stents put in, very, very scary. And, but, you know, with, medicine today they're getting really good at doing all that stuff but I really hope that you're okay and oh you're going home today oh good well and you just take care I mean you know I I, I personally have never had a heart attack um I've had a high blood pressure stroke level blood pressure but I've never had a heart attack and I've had I, I actually have a friend who had a heart attack and they're telling me you need to you know do what you can to not have one because it's not fun. <laughs> I can imagine. I'm so sorry that you're having to deal with this. And my heart just goes out to you. And, you know, I just say, just take it easy. Don't put too much stress on pressure on yourself to just heal. Allow your body to heal. Remain calm. If I can help you with anything, you get a hold of me. You know, you know, my info, my email info. So if I can help you with anything, um, you know, be sure and get a hold of me. That's so hard. You know, you take good care of yourself. <laughs> we do. We need to take care of ourselves, and and whatever that means for you, you know, you 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 take care of yourself. You know what I mean? And stay calm and relaxed as much as possible. I think, especially with a heart attack situation, I will be. I will be. If you want prayer, I will. I will definitely be praying for you. And um, I just, yeah, that's so hard, you know, I'm glad you're going home, but I hope you, you know, that you're in a situation where you can actually allow your body to mend and, um, sort of have some sort of, uh, tranquility or sort of peacefulness around you. Cause especially after having a heart attack like that, you don't need more stress, you know? So I'm hoping you can have some sort of, um, 
you know, calm atmosphere around you so that you can, you can heal, right? Because that's so hard. Oh, man, I feel so bad. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that's just terrible. Oh, well, I hope we have a, a complete and whole recovery and that you completely heal from that. So we're looking at step nine. This is page 88. And this is, um, let's see, it's not too lengthy. I have identified the parts of myself connected to self-sabotage. That's the next step up. So this is if we were working on this step, you know, if you were doing this manual yourself or with a group, um, you know, or, or in an ASCA, Adult Survivors of Child Abuse More Center program group, <laughs> this would be a step that they do. I have identified the parts of myself connected to self-sabotage. And um, this step involves identifying and sorting out all the various aspects of yourself so that you can understand which parts are helpful and which are responsible for self-sabotaging acts in your life. Self-sabotage is probably a source of some of the problems you identified in your inner, inner inventory in step eight. By now, you probably know where the self-sabotage comes from and how it affected you as a child. Now, as an adult, you need to look at the part of you that controls this behavior and how it expresses itself in your everyday life. <clears throat> and that's what I talk about quite a bit because um, over the years, you know, I've, like I said, I've been on my healing journey since 2009, which is a long time. <laughs> I've had lots of time to look at this stuff and work through it. And Self-sabotage, I realized, was my, one of my biggest problems, and it was all stemming from uh, not wanting to be wounded again. So, you know, I had to create boundaries. Um, yeah, you rest, Melissa. That's right. You just take it easy. And, I, well, thanks for stopping in this morning to let me know and, you know, what happened there. And stay in touch. Like I said, you can always contact me on my email, you know. And, um, well, thank you for being my friend, you know. It means a lot to me, you know, it really does. And I, and you mean a lot to me. And I, I, I really wish you um, a, a good day at home for your first day home, you know, and I hope you have somebody around who's helpful to you, who can help you. And I just, I'll, I'll be praying for you. Absolutely. So you take care, you take it easy and, and stay in touch. Absolutely. I'll be thinking of you. And... So these things that we do, I mean, people can do any number of things, self-sabotaging stuff. But I talk about mine because it's not necessarily that uncommon, um, you know, for people to do things like that without realizing that it's even uh, self-sabotage, right? Um, we may not even realize and recognize the patterns. But I started to actually pay attention when, when things would go wrong in my life and I was making this decision that were... Um, uh, detrimental to my adult life you know what I mean it's kind of like things aren't working well here and I seem to be the cause what's going on um you know I had to start looking at the patterns of why I was doing what I was doing and once I started to look at the patterns I started to see exactly why I was doing what I was doing so which really then I needed to work on changing that and that's the hard part because it's you know that's the that's the part that actually requires work identifying it does too but it's actually then i got to put into practice these things that i'm that are going to help me so that i don't keep doing that it keeps self self-sabotaging you know and there's so many ways that people do self-sabotage their life without even realizing it, right? and that's what i was doing so um that's why i share my stuff that way people just in case sort of give you an idea of what somebody can do who's come from a life of uh, you know a childhood of abuse of any type and how these things, you know, don't work well in our adult lives, right? So they said, as you identify the parts of your of, of you responsible for the self-sabotage, you will probably discover adult versions of the childhood roles you played. Many of the most common roles that adult survivors used as children are still employed, but bear different title or different labels. For instance, codependent for caretaker, a masochist for scapegoat, offender for bully, leader for hero, and eccentric for recluse. Although certain aspects of these roles may help you in your daily functioning, they will create problems for you if you let them dominate your interactions. For example, caretaking is an essential part of parenting, but dominating or over-controlling your child is a common characteristic of codependent mothers. Try to identify what roles you adopt as an adult, the positive ones as well as the problematic ones. Learning to strengthen the healthy aspects of yourself while controlling the less helpful ones will be a major task in stage two and stage three recovery. 
And um, these things are very difficult. They really are. Uh, a book that was very helpful for me to see about role playing and the roles that I was forced to play as a child that I, some I took on myself probably and some were made, that was made to play that role because that's how I was forced to behave a certain way or the, to avoid abuse, right? So a lot of those roles, I didn't even realize I was playing. I found um, John Bradshaw's book, Healing the Shame That Binds You, and very uh, helpful to look at what the roles, a lot of the roles are that abused children take on or are forced to take on to, um, you know, to avoid abuse, right? And then are expected to play later through their life with that same dysfunctional group, family group. This is if the, if the abuse was like familial, like within the family. And these things can be very difficult. And I was reading through that book, uh, John Bradshaw's book, and I realized I had all of these roles that were really, um, really were put on me. I didn't even put them there myself. I don't think a lot of them, it was just to avoid the abuse. Right? So I took those, all those roles that were those role-playing things that I was forced to do and, and maybe took on that were hanging around my neck and I threw them away. They're not, you know, I just was like done with that. I'm not playing those roles anymore. <laughs> I'm taking control of my life, you know, and I'm taking, I'm setting the boundaries. I'm making the decisions. I'm the adult in the situation. And, but I didn't see it until I actually read his book. I had no, no idea that I was doing that, doing that. Right. So all this stuff is very difficult sometimes to see until you actually read something or, you know, read a book somehow, some, some survivor book. And all of a sudden it's like, Oh, this makes sense. Now I see what I've been doing. And it's very helpful uh, because then I can start working on it. Now it's taken time to develop these new um, healthier behavioral patterns, like setting boundaries, standing up for myself, asserting my rights, not, not being abusive, not being that type. Like I'm talking being assertive, like I can stand up when I feel that something is not going right. Something that's just bothering me. I do have the right to address it. Not abusively. I don't want to be an abuser. <laughs> I don't want to be my parents. That's what I said yesterday. I'm like, I don't want to be my abusers. Um, I don't want to be anything like that. But I also don't want to be somebody who gets run over all the time either. Um, you know, trying to be so nice or so helpful um, that, that people take advantage because people will. That's just human. Right? We all have the right to stand up for our boundaries, the right to stand up for our rights and our needs. Very important. Right, especially if you were abused as a, in a familial situation as a child where you didn't have the right to even well, obviously you don't have the right to protect yourself in any situation as in a survivor of abuse. But if you didn't have the right to state your needs and your needs were not met and you were abused because you might have stated your needs, that's what happened to me. Um, you know, then all of a sudden trying to get my needs met as an adult is very difficult. Right? It's kind of like, well, you know, if I push it, it's just going to cause problems. You know. That's just my adult me thinking like my child me who was abused. See, so I have to I have to consciously, you know, think about these things and recognize, you know, if something in my life is going on where I feel that my needs aren't being met or my boundaries are being crossed. People are, you know, sort of becoming, you know, maybe they don't even intend to do it but they're just coming across as being sort of um, pushy or whatever. I have the right to stand up for myself. Absolutely. So and I'm le I've learned how to do this actually, which is great, but it did take me time. It took me a lot of time. Um, didn't happen overnight, like I said, and I've, I've worked at it for years now. And so it's, I'm pro it's proven to me that, that it holds everything that I've set up for myself is actually working, which is the boundary work and the, um, you know, allowing myself to say, you know, my needs need to be met as well. I would, I would expect that somebody else in a relationship, any type of relationship, working relationship or friendship or whatever, they're going to tell me what their needs are. And, you know, if, if I cross a boundary, they're certainly going to let me know. But I need to be able to do that back without hurting somebody or without hurting myself and, uh, you know, or without destroying the relationship. And it's it's difficult. It really is. It's unless you you get some practice at it. It's you know if you're not used to it. Um, for me, I had to seriously work at this stuff really, and it's it's been hard. Like I said, um, 
just to realize that we do have rights and we do have the right to protect ourselves. We do have the right to stand up for our needs. We even do, we have the right to have a need, you know, and that's a big thing for survivors of abuse who were not allowed to have needs. Our needs were taken away from us or we just, we just weren't met, you know? So um, we do have the right as an adult to be non-abusive to people, but still get our net, our needs met. <laughs> and so I'm, I've learned how to do that, which is great. And my boundaries are really strong. Um, I, you know, and I don't mind standing up for my boundaries, not at all. And without being rude and hurtful and, you know, but it's just that I, I want to respect other people's boundaries because that's how relationships work. You know, these healthy boundaries, right? And it's like, I want to respect other people's boundaries. And I do expect that they're going to do the same for me. It's that mutual respect. Um, so I know if I step over somebody's boundary, I would expect they're going to say something to me and I'm going to have to, to not do that. Right. And that's the same for me. You know, somebody steps over my boundary and I, and I say something about it, then I would expect that person to do the same for me. It's got to be mutual. Right. And that's what it's all about. But that's why these things are difficult if we've never learned how to do it properly. So, um, you know, there's a lot of info out there about this stuff. If you, you know, if you check around, you look into it about boundary work and stuff like that. Um, you can find tons and tons of free resources online about boundaries, healthy boundaries, codependency. That's another issue. I did a lot of looking into codependency and I recognize it now. Um, before I didn't even know, cause I was just brought up in a very toxic codependent situation. And, um, now I know what it is and I know what to look for in relationships. Um, and it's, I'm glad I did the work on that. Um, that Robert Bernie has a, a book called uh, Codependency, The Dance of Wounded Souls. And that's Robert Bernie, B-U-R-N-E-Y. That's a great book. And I, I, a friend of mine sent me that book. And he autographed, he actually, he autographed it and he wrote me a nice letter and everything. And they're really nice. And, um, you know, that was really special to me. And that, that was a helpful book, absolutely. But he has a lot of material, at least he used to, online for free. And uh, great material for people who have, may have grown up in a situation where they were um, in a codependent situation that's toxic, right? Because there's healthy codependency, which is necessary, but then there's this toxic codependency that's a real problem for adult survivors of child abuse. So um, number two, this is uh, self-help. Oh, actually, we're gonna do number one. Sorry, we haven't even looked at that. This is a self-help section for this, this particular step. Write about your various adult roles or parts in your journal and explore how they operate in your life. Describe in, much, in as much detail as you can when these roles emerge, what behaviors are connected to them and what feelings about yourself and others they engender. Who seems to trigger the emergence of the roles in you? Um, for instance, spouse, lover, children, peers, superiors at work, family, members of, of the opposite sex, or people of the same sex or as your abuser, do you own these parts for yourself or protect them or project them onto others? That's kind of interesting. And this is where this stuff is really tricky. Um, it depends, you know, on the situation. Like I said, we're all different. We've all been through different things. As a survivor of abuse, you know, all of us would have gone through different things. And um, any different situations, and we're all different people, right? <laughs> So, you know, looking at that for me, it means, you know, authority figures are definitely a problem for me. I have a, and, I, and I don't mind, like, I don't ever want to be the boss. You know, that's why I never wanted to have a career and being the, the person in charge. I like to be the, uh, the person that under that person that helps out. In other words, I like to be the helper. Taking orders from somebody who I trust and doing a good job because that makes me feel good. Um, some people have, have said that's kind of brown nosing, but I don't think so. What it does is it makes me feel good to be a part of the work being done that needs to be done, like a cog in the wheel. I like to do my part and keep it up. So in other words, I don't try to do everybody else's part too and mine to look good. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, it's not that. It's the issue that I just want to do a good job because at the end of the day, I just want people to be Pleased with my work. Let's say it's a working situation, you know, pleased with my work. Right? And so um, I, I don't, you know, as far as being a leader and stuff like that, that's not never been my interest. Um, you know, so I've never gone for managerial type jobs, things like that. I always like to be sort of the under uh, one of the workers who gets a worker bee, gets the job done, goes home for the day. That's what I like. Um, that's where I fit in best. And um, so 
authority figures, you know, if, if, if a boss comes across as resembling anything like my mother or even my dad, it's a problem <laughs> because I'm right away see my abuser. See? And so, you know, I've met some horrible bosses in my lifetime. Not every boss is good. Not every boss is a good boss. Not every worker is a good worker. I mean, people are just, just people, right? But I tend to, you know, I don't know. No, I don't have a lot of room for abusive people. So if, you know, any, any of any, in any situation, and there are a lot of people that are very unwell out there who, who are in charge of things, right? Sadly enough, and they do hurt people, right? But the thing, and some people will sit there and take it because they want to keep the job. For me, I'm like, screw the job. My, uh, my mental health and my, my, my peace, my personal peace, my personal well-being is so much more important to me than a job because um, I can find another job. I really, I won't work for people that are like, that, that resemble anything like my abuser parents, controlling, manipulating, rude, hurtful. Um, the minute I see one of those, any of that stuff come, come, you know, I almost don't even give people a second chance. It's kind of like, I see that and I'm gone. <laughs> I'm like, no, cause life's too short. I will not be around that. I was forced to be around that as a child. And as an adult, I mean, that's just my boundary. And I've left many jobs because of toxic um, manager man, management. And there's nothing you can do. I mean, you know, even if you had a group of people that said, yeah, they are toxic. Um, you, you know, they're in that role. That's the role they're playing. So I tend to leave stuff like that because I'm like, look, it's not that important to me. Relationship stuff, um, you know, do I see my abusers and people? Not necessarily. It's more, it would have to be more of an authority figure over me. You know what I mean? So that's why the boss situation is always a problem. Um, but as, as far as, you know, getting our needs met, these type of things, um, you know, in any kind of relationship, it can work that way. If somebody becomes too aggressive, too uh, controlling, I immediately notice it because my mother was very controlling and so was my dad. They were my abusers. Right? And so I, as an adult, I have the right to um, state that, you know, if something's bothering me about this issue with this relationship, it's really up to me to say, well, stop sign, something wrong, red flags going up, this person is controlling, this person is whatever the issue is, you know what I mean? And I do have the right at that point to decide how I'm gonna handle it. Um, and that's what I'm learning how to do. And I, and I have learned how to do it because I've, I've done that for years now. But when I first started my healing journey, I, I had a lot of work to do, let me tell you, in this area. And it's just because I didn't want to hurt anybody, but I also didn't want to be hurt. So then I would just bow out gracefully and leave. And sometimes I still do that. But now I'm learning how to how to stand up for myself. And it's like, you know, we, we have the right to say no. We don't have to be the people pleaser. We don't have to be the perfect one. You know, we don't have to be any of those roles that we were set up for, whatever they may be, you know. And we have a life to live as long as we're not abusing somebody and we're not hurting ourselves, and, you know, um, then it's good. You know what I mean? So, and we, that's how everybody wants to live. You think about it. That's what people are doing. But there are a lot of toxic people out there that, that, that just don't even realize, I think, that they are toxic, that they've been allowed to behave that way for so long, that they're, they think that's fine. You know, and it's like, you know, it's kind of sad, but true. And they haven't worked through their own stuff more than likely. And so we will run into people like that, you know, but we do have a right to stand up for ourselves. That's all I'm saying. So whoever these people that seem to trigger, you know, these emergence of these roles in us, but we have, we, you know, we don't, we don't want to project our abusers onto others, but we need to recognize abusive behavior. Right. And if, you know, as growing up abused as a child, I do recognize abusive behavior. Definitely. <laughs> it's like, you know, and I, I'm almost, and I'm, very aware of what people are you know doing in the relationship and I'm now I've got my boundaries set so I'm like you know very secure on what I'm really going to allow what I'm not going to allow in that relationship 
So it's a great place to be, let me tell you, instead of being railroaded or run over or manipulated, um, this kind of stuff, uh, or just treated bad in general. <laughs> it's like, no, I don't have time for that. You know what I mean? I spent my whole child and youth being mistreated and abused. And, you know, I'm not doing that anymore. So I'm standing up for myself regardless. You know what I mean? And we do have the right to do that. Absolutely. Everybody does. We all have the right to stand up for ourselves. So very important. Number two, ask the trusted people in your life how they see you. Don't react to anything they say immediately. Instead, reflect on their comments for a day or two and see how others' observations compare to the various roles you have identified for yourself. Trusted people in your life. Now, see, that's that's not asking just anybody how they see you. <laughs> you are, this would be somebody you trust who knows you, right? who really knows you, and it's not going to say things to hurt you. Um, you don't want to get that advice from people that don't know you very well because they're people see people in all sorts of ways. You know what I mean? So that's not going to be helpful. Um, it has to be people that actually really know you and people that you trust, right? To give you an honest opinion of what they see about you that are you, are you still kind of playing roles that you used to play? And because I know so many survivors of abuse and other people who have been on their healing journey for years and made great progress, um, I actually have some very trusted friends that, you know, if I could go to and I could ask them that. I actually have actually in the past. Um, and I, I trust what they're saying to me is valuable information that's not meant to hurt me. You don't want to just do that with anybody. You know what I mean? You have to be very selective because there are people out there who would just love to run you down and make you feel even worse than before. You know what I'm saying? So don't do not do that with just people you don't know. Um, it should be trusted people in your life. Right? And can you really trust these people? That's the issue. Really trusted people that you know are not going to say something just to be vindictive or hurtful. It's just going to be their honest feedback and they're not going to be trying to hurt you with it. And therefore, you know, it's pretty safe to do something like that. But I wouldn't do that with very many people, only my very closest trusted friends in my life. Because otherwise, I really personally don't care what other people really think about me because they only know me. They only see, uh, you know, the one page that they've come in on. Like a friend of mine was saying, don't judge, don't judge my life by the by the page you came in on sort of thing. You know what I mean? Um, it's, it's, we all kind of tend to do that, right? Which is, it's, it's not very nice, but we, I think it's human nature and we all sort of do that. But I, that's why I would say you get some trusted people in your life to do that. Not people you don't know that well, because <laughs> you may not like what they have to say about you. That'd be terrible. Number three, share in ASCA meetings regarding your progress and identifying the various roles you play and aspects of yourself that are self-sabotaging. Also share how you are gaining mastery over these areas. And uh, like I said, I talk a lot about self-sabotage, but that's because um, it, it's been uh, it's been my biggest problem is my own self-sabotage. <laughs> what I do to myself, you know, in relationship stuff, whatever it is. Um, so, you know, I'm honest about my stuff. And it's, you know, it's it's hard to take a look at this stuff and say, what am I doing? It's causing me... You know, I've already come through abuse, which is bad enough, you know what I'm saying, which is horrible. And then now as an adult, what am I doing to myself? Why am I, you know, how come I can't, you know, get a certain situation fixed in my life? Why does it keep coming back to this? For me, I started to recognize patterns, right? That's what I'm saying. I was like, I always end up here. <laughs> how do I end up in this situation? It's like, okay, it's me doing it, obviously. Uh, I need to take a good hard look at what I'm doing. And it's it's hard, right? It really is because we have to be really brutally honest with ourselves and that's hard. It's rough. Number four, if you haven't done so already, try to record your dreams in your journal so that you can see how the different parts of your of you interact on an unconscious level. Record each dream in story form with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Tell the story in the first person. Develop the details and imagery as you write. Many people think that because they don't remember their dreams, they don't dream. This is inaccurate. Everyone dreams, although denial and repression may make your dreams unavailable to your conscious awareness. Uh, practice remembering your dreams will help you actually remember them. Develop a routine of leaving your journal next to your bed. And when you first wake up, ask yourself what dreams you had and record them. So that's just a suggestion from them. You know, you don't have to do any of this stuff. These are just ideas to help you and, you know, to help me <laughs> if we wanted to try something like that. 
I used to record my dreams once in a while. Um, and dreams for me, most of my dreams are just sort of odd. They're, you know, I'm just usually in a city somewhere. I don't even know where it is. Some big city. Um, lost. Can't find my, can't find my car. Can't find my house. Can't find, I don't even have a house. It's always an apartment. Can't find my apartment. Can't find my building. Uh, I'm with strangers. I don't know these people. Um, I never dream about, um, like, most people in my life that I personally know, I never dream about. They're not in my dreams. It's always strangers. And have I dreamed about my, the abuse? I used to, right up until probably about the age of 34, let's say, 35. Uh, my husband was t- diagnosed terminally ill when I was 35. And that took my focus off of the abuse that I suffered because all of a sudden we were trying to keep him alive and I was very busy trying to help him stay alive, right? So the focus was no longer on, uh, you know, I was, I was no longer struggling with this, this horrible stuff that, I had, that almost killed me and almost made me take my own life, um, was put on hold because I had a new crisis, right? And so uh, I did used to dream about the abuse quite a bit uh, from about the age of 29, I'd say 29 to about 34, 35, somewhere in there. And it was horrible, absolutely horrible. But, you know, we can write this stuff down and see if, if it, you know, if we can learn something from it. I've never really been into dream work because dreams, you know, they're just your mind playing out whatever you've seen through the day sort of thing, whatever's going on in your life. Some dreams have been very interesting for me that are reoccurring dreams. And those are the ones I pay attention to. Dreams that are reoccurring that I have more than two or three times I start to really pay attention to it because I'm like, hmm, why am I dreaming that? Got to be a reason. You know, it's the same dream. It's like, okay, there's something I need to look at here. So most of my dreams I don't worry about unless it's something I keep dreaming about all the time. It's the same thing, right? Professional health. This is page 89. How much time do we have? Oh, yes, we got time. Number one, working with your therapist, try to give expression to all the different roles you play. You cannot learn how to strengthen or reduce the parts without first giving each of them a voice and perhaps even a name. So as you experience and express each part or role, try to relate it to specific memories, images, and dialogues from your past. What were the conflicts in these situations? What about each part uh, what, what about each part made you feel good? Which of your roles comes out most frequently with your therapist? Does it help you to get what you want from your therapist? If not, talk with your therapist about what roles might be more effective in getting you what you want and need. Number two, this is a crucial time in your therapy because it can be tricky to enhance the healthy parts of your personality and at the same time increase your control of the maladaptive parts. Your therapist your therapist is well qualified to help you strengthen those parts that promise change and hope. Well, that's nice. That's a nice thing to think about. Number three, in the section we in this section we've been talking about parts or roles that are similar to character traits or tendencies. While distinct, they form part of the coherent and unified personality that is you. So if you are aware of having antagonistic or aggressive subpersonalities or multiple personalities that are more autonomous than this, you will need strong guidance from your therapist to decide how best to reduce their impact on um, an intrusion into your life. So a discussion of true multiple personalities and ways of working with persons who exhibit them is beyond the scope of this man. But briefly stated, however, the predominant therapeutic approach today is to ask you to speak to the various subpersonalities within yourself and negotiate a sort of truce that will reduce the power of these pers- pers- persecutory parts <laughs> and help you to regain full control over your primary personality. It's quite interesting. I, the work that I did with... Um, my Envision Mind out of Australia, that's Beverly Searle's program, was getting in touch with those subpersonalities, the little me's that were wounded and um, at the different ages, right? So I did a lot of work on that. And I did, I do realize that it's really my 10 year old who's running the show, <laughs> which is not good because I'm 55, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, decisions along life's path shouldn't be made by a 10 year old. Uh, who was abused and is, you know, fearful of everything and really angry. So it's kind of like, you know, I've had to work with that, (laughs) you know, to help myself, right? Not everyone's out to hurt me. Not everyone is an abuser, right? Of course, I know this. I've had many good friends in my lifetime and good relationships with people. 
And, you know, it's just the issue that sometimes somebody, just a certain person or something that happens in a relationship causes that 10 year old part of myself who was so wounded and wanted to die really. Um, and does, and is fearful and doesn't trust anybody. Um, not even me. <laughs> she doesn't trust me, the adult me. She doesn't trust anybody. Um, she, I make decisions based on how I'm feeling from that, from that sub personality. And it's kind of like, so I cut people off really quick. I'm like, you know, you're going to hurt me. You're gone. You know what I mean? And this is somebody that I would love and care about the same, um, who would never on purpose hurt me. They might've done something that, that hurt me in a way that I should have told them, Hey, that hurt me, man. You know what I mean? Um, but that 10 year old doesn't wait around for that kind of stuff. <laughs> She's like, no, no, they're going to hurt us. They got to go, man. So, you know, I've had an issue with that with my whole life. Right. And also, you know, running, just run, 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 run from everything that could be a potential problem. You know, um, it's like, well, you know, I've got to stop letting the 10 year old make all the very important decisions for my adult life. Right? <laughs> I was talking to a friend of mine who actually helped design that program, Kate Mitchell out of Australia. And she's the one that got me started on that program years ago that my envision mind it's a meditation i've been talking about it on this show quite a bit now and um she was telling me she said you know you you don't want to completely cut off your 10 year old she needs to have a voice but you know you need to still do some work with her to realize that you know you're fine now <laughs> and you you're the adult in the situation so you need to make those decisions she needs to be 10 and you know coloring or whatever she liked to do as a child right and I, I'm like, oh, okay, I guess you know, I need to do some more work, you know. So that's getting in touch with those sub personalities, right? I don't, I'm not a multiple personality person. I think the reason I can tell that is because I don't ever lose time. Where I, I, I actually know people who are multiple who lose time. Um, one multi, one personality will come out, the other one goes away. Then when the other one comes back, they have no clue what just happened for that 20 minutes, because the other personality was was there talking and doing their thing, and so. Um, they lose track of, they lose time. My sister does that, and I think my sister's multiple. She's DID, I know that. But she's, she may be multiple, I don't know. You know what I mean? Um, big possibility. She loses time all the time. She has no no clue what she's done half the day. Um, she doesn't have a clue what happened yesterday. No clue what happened 10 years ago, five years ago. She remembers her daughter, you know what I'm saying? Like she has a daughter, a grown daughter, my niece. Um but, she, you know, it's not, it's not like she forgets stuff like that. She remembers to show up to work. But she can't tell you what she was doing for certain periods of the day. So I, I think she's multiple. And she's never been diagnosed multiple that I know of. But I, I think she is. Um, I don't think I am. I just have all of these wounded parts that are still there that were stuck in the limbic system. Because the trauma, that's where it's stored in the limbic system in the brain. And that's what that program does. It goes in with pictures um, so that, you know, we're we're actually addressing um, that those those little wounded parts of ourselves, whoever they were in your situation or mine, and um, getting them some help, right, from from the inside, doing a meditation. So I think it, it's really it's very helpful for me to do that. I, at first, I didn't like that whole inner child thing. I didn't like the idea of it. Um, but then I started studying, looking into it, especially with John Bradshaw's book, and I thought, oh, I see. It's just the places where I was wounded, that trauma. I got stuck there because of the trauma. So I need to go in and address that stuff. That's what I've been doing. So it is quite interesting. And we have step 10 next. That's on page 90. And we have about 15 minutes. So what did the, do you want to say anything else about this before we move on? Yeah, so many people are... Um, you know, if we don't recognize this stuff, you know, get help with this stuff, we just keep doing these roles, which may have been helpful when we were um, children to help get through the abuse, but now are not useful. Right? And that's why they bring this up. You know, we still may be doing these things, um, you know, whatever they are in your life, taking on these roles, uh, whether it's bully or being the bully or the leader or the caretaker you know, codependent for caretaker stuff, masochist for scapegoat, this kind of stuff, right? Um, whatever these are, these are really, once you identify them, you know, like me, once I identified what I was doing, 
I realized that, you know, I don't have to play those roles anymore. It's my adult life. And, you know, I, I can live it the way that I want to, you know what I mean? And that's the beauty, I guess, of, of this healing journey stuff for me, even though it's been very difficult to go through this stuff and to look at the abuse and go back and face this stuff, which has been horrific. But the thing is, is what it's done is uh, freed me up now to realize that I, I am truly in charge of my day. This is my day today, just like it's your day. <laughs> and we can choose what we're going to have in it. We can make that choice. And I started to realize, like, you know, yeah, I mean, I have the, it's truly up to me whether I'm going to have a, a good day, right? Because it's, it's up to me who I'm going to allow around, who, is, who I'm going to allow in my life, right? What kind of people, what kind of situation, you know, what I'm going to do with my time. And so, you know, it's, it's, like I said, I have so many more better days now than I've ever had in my entire lifetime. And things, you know, things aren't perfect. They're definitely, not, they're definitely not perfect. All last year, I thought I was going to be homeless. <laughs> this is like, you know, I'm about ready to be homeless here. That was, that wasn't fun. And um, you know, I'm like, yeah, but I can handle it. You know, um, I've been through worse. So it's like, you know, these things. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's never really going to be perfect. Right. This is the issue. We might be, you know, hoping that everything would just be perfect, but we have to be real. Life is not perfect. It's not, every day isn't going to be great, you know, and there are going to be times where it's just going to be really horrible, right? And it, that's the issue. That's life, right? So I think that's why it's really important as survivors of abuse, we've already come through a, you know, horrific situation, but we never should have had to, d- to deal with, right? Never should have had to go through that. Um, we should set ourselves up for the best possible chance of finding what it is in life that we really want. You know, whatever that is for you. You know, for me, it's it was just a life of peace because I grew up in a war zone with my abusive parents who were abusing each other and all the children. And I thought, you know, I want peace around me. I want, it doesn't have to be quiet. I want serenity. I want no abuse, no violence. Nobody's around me is going to just become violent and start acting violent. I want good people in my life who are going to treat me decently. I want to do the same for them. Very simple things for me, you know what I mean? Um, I just wanted to have, be able to finish off my days um, in a peaceful environment. So I feel like I feel a lot better because I haven't had people around me who are abusive for a long time. And it's great. <laughs> it really is. I'm like, ah, oh, I can relax. I can breathe, you know. I don't have to have somebody's fist in my face, you know. Um, or throwing me across the room or something, or calling me names, you know. Um, so it's very important to me who I keep in my life and who I won't, um, who I allow in my world, who I won't. And you can do that for yourself. You know, we can set ourselves up to to get our needs met, to have a good life, right? And it's just important to start somewhere. If you haven't already, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm talking to people that maybe just haven't really started and they're just kind of thinking, it's never going to happen for me. You know what I mean? I'll, I'll never get there. And it's like, well, well, no, that that was my attitude until I started reaching out. You know, my I, I until I realized I needed help. I was like, why am I doing this? Like, why am I allowing myself to be destroyed by something that, you know, these horrible people did to me as a child? And now what? Now I'm like, 41 and a half and I'm still trying to destroy my own life like hello I need help right started to become angry at myself because I'm like okay I've let myself now um ruin so many years because I didn't get help right that's sad I wish I would have got help like I said a long time ago I wish I would have got help as a young adult right right around you know even before the age of 20 right I wish I would have sought out professional help um, or some sort of support group stuff. But unfortunately, I didn't start until 42. But the thing is, I'm glad that I started, right? This is the issue. It's kind of like, hey, better late than never. That's what I say, right? So important, right? Because, you know, I've watched so many people not do that and not get help and, and end up with, you know, at the end of their days, just miserable. And I just, I watched my mom do it. I watched my dad do it. 
And, you know, I thought, I'm not doing that. No, <laughs> no, I'm not following their example. You know, I'm going to reach out and get some help. I'm so glad that I did. That's why I always encourage people, you know, if you're struggling and you just don't know what you're going to do, you know, and you have never reached out to, to anybody about this stuff. You know, there, there is help there. You just have to find what works for you, right? Because we're all different, we're all different needs. And you need to find what, what's best for you, right? Whatever it is, and then go for it. And like I said, it's not like, oh, oh, I've started my healing journey. I'm, I've been on for 10, you know, 11, 12 years, and I feel great. And everything's wonderful. It's like, no, no, <laughs> everything isn't wonderful. And, it, you know, I have hard days and bad days, too, just like everybody else. That's life. That's, that's real life, right? That's that's what life is. It's ups and downs, but we have to learn how to handle those ups and downs, and that's the issue. I, I never, I was never um, shown how to cope properly, because in my family, whenever there was a crisis, everybody was talking about suicide. So that's what I took on. My two of my siblings killed themselves at the, in their thirties. So you know, for me, crisis, oh, you know, suicide. Yeah, it's over. And now I'm like, no. I win because <laughs> I'm staying alive. And that's what I want you to do too. You know, if you're struggling and you don't know what you're going to do, you need to stick it out because I'm telling you it's worth it. It really is. Cause why? Cause you're worth it. There was a guy, I actually saw his website a long time ago. I actually did some, some looking at his stuff and um, I forget now what it was called, but he was, uh, he was a suicide prevention guy. And I just loved him. I, I have to go back and find his stuff because he would say, I love you. You know, he had, he had like a little video clip there and he had a little thing written out. And he's like, I want you to get help because I love you. And I thought, how awesome is that? What a nice guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Puts himself out there like that, you know, and he probably does. Right. And that's how I feel. You know, like I've learned how to love myself. Right. Coming from such horrific abuse. Um, you know, I'm, I'm learning, I, I've learned how to love the wounded part of myself, which was something I had a hard time doing. Um, and I'm learning how to love other people, you know, and have, have find this good stuff in life that really makes life worth living, you know. Um, but it's taken some effort. It's taken some, you know, some work, right? So this is the issue. It's just not going to happen. Just quick fingers. Oh, it's all fixed. It's all better. It doesn't work like that, unfortunately. Because that's, you know, all of us would really like that. I think we would all like that. Just, you know, blink your eyes and everything's perfect. <laughs> it's like, sure, let's do it. it. doesn't work that way. That's not reality, you know. So it's whatever, you know, whatever you need to do to so that you can have a good life, whatever good life means to you. And, you know, that's why I'm saying all of us are different. We all need different things. But whatever it is you need, you know, you can take a look at what, Write it down. What are my needs? What do I really, what do I want? What do I want in the next five years? What do I want in the next six months? You know, how do I want my life to go, right? What am I going to allow in my life? What am I not going to allow? This kind of stuff. I did all of that. I wrote all those lists out, looked at the pros and cons of a lot of different things and figured out exactly what I wanted and that I knew that I could, that I could attain, you know, and that was mainly just that I would not ever allow anybody to abuse me ever again. And I would stand up for myself, stand up for my rights, and I would stand up for others as well. And that's why I speak out against child abuse and, and really try to be a, vo a voice out here. Right? And, um, you know, I also, I, I want to treat people really well, but I also want to be treated well. You know, all these very simple things that most people just take for granted, that's the good life for me, you know. And so it's, it's whatever it is for you, right? So you certainly did not deserve to be abused if you're listening to this and watching you, you know, you were abused. You didn't deserve that. You deserve to have a good life. You really do. Because we all do. That's what we're all on this planet doing, right? Unfortunately, there's so much horrible stuff going on, as we can see, right? But in my own personal world, that's what I'm saying. You know, I can't control a lot of things. A lot of times survivors of abuse will, will have these control issues because obviously we didn't have any control as a child being abused. So then quite often we're trying to control everything and everyone in our life and you can't you can't you can't control every situation you can't control everybody <laughs> it doesn't work that way what i can do is set boundaries 
and make sure that those boundaries are very solid and say, ah, oh, no one will ever abuse me ever again because I'm not going to allow it. And also I'm going to stand up for myself. That's a boundary. Right? And see somebody cross my boundary and uh, for any reason, you know, hurt me or try to railroad me or take advantage or anything like that. They're stepped over my boundary. I have the right to say, hello, you've just crossed my boundary. This is not the way it's going to be. <laughs> not with me. Sorry. Because there are people out there that will, that are hurtful. And some of them on purpose and some just don't realize what they're doing. Right? Not everybody's out there trying to be hurtful. Some people are abusive types and they don't mind. They think it's great. Like as you can, my parents were horrifically abusive types. And they loved it. They thought it was great. But, um, you know, that's that's not okay. But the thing is, is sometimes people are like that, but they don't realize they're even doing it, right? So, we, you know, we don't have to be abusive, but we can be assertive. We can say, hi, <laughs> you just crossed my boundary. I'm sorry. You know, I don't allow that in my life, um, you know, or whatever these issues are, right? And because you know they're going to do that to you. Most people will defend their boundaries. But abuse survivors have a, a bit of an issue with that sometimes, right? Because it's like, well, you know. I don't even know if I can stand up for myself. It's like, yes, you can. You have rights and you have the right to a good life, right? So make sure if whatever you're going through, if you're struggling, if you don't want to be struggling on your own, then you reach out. There's good groups out there. There's good people out there. You just have to look for them. And you have to be careful who you give your information to. Check the stuff out first, you know, make sure they're trustworthy before you get involved, you know, and, um, you know, reach out. There's lots of good help out there. And if you need any resources, you can contact me on my website, on my, either on my website or my email, whatever. It's all in the about section there. I posted a, a post in the community section. I'm going to be doing an interview to, uh, this evening. And I'm going to be sitting in the hot seat. <laughs> I'm usually the one doing the interviews and actually talk, asking people questions. But it's, uh, it's an interview for me. That it's my 10-year anniversary as an author going public with my story and a life of death redemption. Um, the, my first book that I wrote about the abuse. It was actually a blog first, but my friends were like, you need to publish it, get it out there. But like I said, I don't want the money for those books. I donate the money to stop and prevent child abuse. I always have, always will. It's set up now that if something happens to me and I pass away or something, that money will always go to stop and prevent child abuse. So that makes me really happy. And uh, that's what I wanted. That's that's good. So I'll be on doing an interview. on it's, it, The link is there in that community discussion section that I was there. If you wanted to join me tonight, seven o'clock uh, Mountain Standard Time. It's uh, Advocates United for Humanity. That's who I volunteer with. And it's AU4H Radio. But my friends are going to interview me, which is really cool. I usually do the interviews, like I said. <laughs> so my friends, I'm going to be sitting in the hot seat. You know, they said, we'll be, we'll be kind. I'm like, I know they will. <laughs> so, you know, they, they won't be too harsh on me. But uh, if you're interested in joining it, I, I am going to be talking about my story with there and uh, about, about my mission and what I've been doing stuff like that. So if you want to if you want to join me, I'd be happy to have you there. Otherwise, just take really good care of yourself, you know, be good to yourself, be good to those around you. Don't allow anybody to abuse you. you know, not today, not tomorrow. If you're in an abusive situation, you get help, right? And you know, don't abuse yourself. That's what I was doing till the age of 42. Be good to yourself. Be kind to yourself. You know? And we, we do have the right to stand up for ourselves, like I said. So you make sure you get your needs met. We all have the right. We have the right to have our needs met. And so we have to be our own best advocates, right? So it's almost been an hour, so I'm going to shut off for today. I'll close off. And, you know, I wish you a wonderful day. I know some of us are not going to have a good day. And, you know, some of us are not going to have a good day tomorrow. But all I'm saying is hang in there. Don't give up, my friends. Every day that I wake up. And I get up, it's a slap in my abuser's face. That's the way I get back at my abusers because I'm having a good life. And I, I treat myself well. I treat others well. Um, I'm actually enjoying life. And every time I wake up, it's a slap in their face because they couldn't kill me and they couldn't get me to kill myself. So that's what I want for you. I want victory for you as well. So take care, everybody. Till the next time. I'll be on tomorrow morning. See, see you later.